Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? morning. Good. Uh, Well, I'm excited to dive into God's Word. What's up over here? Um, uh, Hey, uh, if you're new to our church, uh, welcome uh, to McLean Bible Church. My name is Mike Kelsey. I'm one of the pastors uh, here. I want to welcome those of you watching from our different locations around the DMV area, as well as those watching uh, from online, wherever you're watching from. It's good to be together, and uh, and I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to dive into God's Word. You can meet me in Nehemiah chapter 1 if you brought your own copy of the Bible with you. If you don't have it, uh, we'll have the verses up on the screen. But we're going to be in Nehemiah uh, 1. Now, before we dive into that, uh, you may have heard of this woman before. I had the privilege of meeting her a few uh, years ago. Her name is Cynthia Marshall. Uh, she's more uh, well known as Cent Marshall for short. She was a legendary executive at AT&T for 36 years before her retirement. And then she uh, came out of retirement and eventually became CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, the first black female CEO in NBA history. Now, uh, I'll give you a little bit of the story there because some of you guys know the story. Uh, But uh, the Dallas Mavericks organization kind of hit a really difficult Uh, season. There was an article uh, that broke uh, some news, uh, some uh, specifically some allegations of sexual harassment and abuse in the Mavericks organization. And so, I mean, the organization was on fire. It was starting to kind of crumble from the inside out as all these things were coming to light. And many of you know the billionaire owner of the Dallas Mavericks, uh, Mark Cuban, who was not necessarily implicated uh, directly in those allegations, but obviously had responsibility for the situation. He began looking for a new CEO. And several different people said to him, listen, you need to go after this woman, Sint Marshall. Now, she had had an illustrious career, again, 36 years at AT AT&T. She's credited with just the kind of culture, the the turnaround culture that happened there at AT AT&T. And and again, she was retired, uh, but people said, she's the one that you need. She'll come, she'll whip this place into shape. You need to try to pursue her. And so he, in a way that I guess only billionaires can do, really just went all after her, just aggressively pursued her. Now, I'm skipping over a lot in in the story, including the fact that she had never even heard the name Mark Cuban. Mark Cuban got her personal cell phone number, was calling her. Her husband answered the phone, and she was like, I don't know who that man is. Hang up, okay? She had no idea who Mark Cuban was. Long story short, she ends up agreeing to sit down and meet with him, and Mark Cuban makes his pitch to her and basically says, this is what's been happening in the organization. And I need a leader. I need somebody that can come in and turn this organizational culture around. And Sports Business Journal captures what happened next. This is what she said to him. Mind you, she's a a strong Christian. And she said to him, I really need to pray about this. She said, I mean, this is coming out of nowhere. She told him she'd give him an answer the next day. And on her way out of the door after that meeting, the, the article says it's about a 55-minute meeting. After that meeting, she's on her way out the door. She said, uh, it says, two women corralled her, asking to talk. They shared their own stories, which backed up what she'd read in that article about those allegations. They said Cuban had told them about her and of how she, about how he hoped to hire her to lead an overhaul of the organization's culture. And they said, Ms. Marshall, you have to come here. We think you can really have an impact here. That night, in a converted closet devoted to prayer and meditation, Marshall thought back to the word one of the women had used, impact. It's what she recently realized she wanted from her next role in her retirement. And she said this. She said, I prayed, okay, Lord, impact. I need you to let me know if this is where I need to have impact. Make it real clear to me that this is your will and I'll let mine go. Because I thought I was getting ready to be a college president or run some sort of nonprofit. All right, she's had an incredible career. She is a strong Christian. And in fact, I would highly recommend 
that you look her up. She's one of the greatest examples I can think of, of somebody faithfully representing Jesus in the marketplace. And she's like, all right, Lord, I had this corporate career. I'm trying to pivot into nonprofit. I want to serve in my local church. I thought that's what this runway of retirement was going to look like for me. And then it says this, when she emerged from prayer, she had her answer. And the Lord confirmed in her heart, this is what I'm calling you to do. It was not a job. It was a calling to come and help renovate the organizational culture to be a more just and equitable and, quite frankly, profitable organizational culture. Now, here's why I mentioned that. And again, I'd highly recommend you look up St. Marshall, just an incredible example of faithfulness uh, uh, as a follower of Jesus in, uh, in the marketplace. Here's why I bring her story up though. Because we tend, especially here in the DC area, movers and shakers, we're hustling, grinding, we're, we're always on the move. We tend to pit prayer against productivity. To, to the point where we almost treat those like they're two different personality profiles. Right. So some of y'all are like, all right, those are the prayer people over here. But over here, we're the people that get things done in the real world. Vice versa, there's some of y'all that are like, those are the people running around doing a whole bunch of stuff in their own strength. We're the ones over here waiting on the Lord. Right. We pit prayer and productivity against each other. Here's what you see, though. As you look throughout church history and as we're going to see in a moment in Scripture, listen, if you're taking notes, write this down off the top. The most productive people in the kingdom of God are the most prayerful people. The most productive people in the kingdom of God are the most prayerful people. There's a reason why St. Marshall, one of the first things she does is she tells billionaire mogul Mark Cuban, I got to pray about it first. Because I'm not doing this unless the Lord tells me to do it. And when you read her story, you see that her whole life, her private life, as well as her public life in articles, in interviews, in the way she leads companies and organizations is characterized by prayer. Here's why. Because the most productive people in the kingdom of God, not the most busy, not the people who have the most human results, but the most productive people in the kingdom of God that bear fruit that remains are the most prayerful people. And that's what we see in the life of a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Now, last week, we started a verse by verse study of the book of Nehemiah in a sermon series we're calling, What Could God Do? What could God do? When you look around at the needs of this world, at the needs of our communities, at the needs in our church, at the needs in our lives and the lives of other people around us, what could God do in and through our lives if we surrendered our desires and our plans and our resources to him for his glory? What could God do? Now, if you missed week one, which was last Sunday, I'd encourage you to check out uh, that message. But let me just give you a summary uh, to kind of get you caught up and make sure we're on the same page. Now, let me just give you a heads up. This is about to be a lot. Okay, I'm about to give you a lot. I'm about to try to give you like an Old Testament survey in about 90 seconds. Is that cool? I already say all the time, I'm just going to do it anyway. It's already in my notes, right? So we're going to do it. So just buckle up, hold your horses. We'll be done in a minute. Let me give you this survey. Now, let me start here. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we talked about this last week, are really two parts of the same story. In fact, in the original canon, they're one scroll. Throughout Christian history, they were separated into two different books in our English Bibles. That's because there are two parts that kind of center around two different main characters, Ezra and Nehemiah. But same story, two different parts. And I'm going to give you some of the background history again so that we're all on the same page. Now, we can summarize the history leading up to Nehemiah under three different headings. All right, if you're taking notes, follow me here. Covenant, sin, judgment. 
You can summarize the history under those three headings. So let's walk through it. Now, in Exodus, God liberated, I told you Old Testament servant. We didn't start in Genesis, okay? We're just starting in Exodus. All right. In Exodus, God liberates his people out of Egyptian slavery and brings, uh, begins to establish them into his own unique covenant community. And they were called to worship him and live in a way that showed the nations around them that he was the one true God. That's why God calls those Israelites a light to the nations, because God chose to use them to reveal to the nations who he is and what he's like and what his leadership is like. You fast forward to Deuteronomy and they are getting ready to enter into the promised land. And what you see there is that God essentially says to them, listen, there's two ways to live. You're at a fork in the road. You can go down the path of obedience, obedience, which which uh, which that's a path where you'll get to experience the covenant blessings of relationship with me. Or you can go down the path of disobedience. And if you go down that path, you will experience the cursings that I will bring into your life. And you read about that in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, fast forward, the people of God are now in the promised land. They're living in Jerusalem. They are now a nation under God's direct authority. The temple is there in Jerusalem, this symbol of God's presence dwelling on earth among his people. And the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by walls. But instead of honoring and appreciating God's leadership, the people continue to embrace sin. So covenant, now sin. And here's the thing. God had been warning his people over and over again that if they persisted in disobedience and idolatry, that he would punish them by allowing them to be conquered and taken captive by foreign nations. And I know some of us bristle as we think about that, but here's essentially what's happening. God says to them, since you want to be like the other nations so badly, then I'm going to give you over to those nations so you can learn firsthand that my leadership is for your good. This is what is called God's passive wrath, where he, at a certain point, he withdraws, right, his covenant blessings and protection. And he says, you know what, then I'm going to give you over to what you think you want. So that you can come face to face with the reality that the grass is not greener on the other side, that the good life is actually lived under my good and wise authority. And so that's exactly what happens. God brings his judgment and not a permanent judgment in the sense of condemnation, but a temporary season of correction of divine discipline designed to draw them back under his leadership and lordship. And so we talked about this last week, 586 BC, the Babylonians overtake Jerusalem and they destroy the city and take the remaining Jews away into captivity. And throughout that time of exile, there's prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah that prophesy a day when God will restore his people back to Jerusalem. 539 BC, the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and as a part of a more kind of peaceful political strategy, they allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And so you see three waves of migration back to Jerusalem, an initial wave of about 50,000, and then a smaller wave of three to 5,000 led by Ezra the priest. And then in 444 BC, Nehemiah, a Jewish man with a successful career in the Persian government, gets a report that the people are not doing well. And specifically, after all these years, by Nehemiah, over 100 years at this point, they still have not been able to rebuild the walls of the city that are needed for protection. And verse 4 is where we landed last week. Everybody take a deep breath, all right? You just got basically the the Old Testament, all right? That's leading up to where we pick up the story in Nehemiah. Nehemiah gets this report, and in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, he says this. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continue fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, we talked about that verse briefly last week, but let me just point this out. I think what we see, because we're going to focus on verse 5 through 11, I I think what we see in verse 5 is the prayer that Nehemiah eventually prayed. 
But when we look at verses one through four, I think Nehemiah's praying just started with crying. Here's why I mention this, because I think somebody needs to hear it. Crying is an acceptable form of praying when you're crying in the presence of God. And sometimes we just don't have the words and sometimes the cliches just don't cut it. And sometimes there's just that gut wrenching pain and all we can get out before God is our tears and our frustration and our confusion and the pain. And listen, it's called lament. What's the difference between lament and a complaint? Lament is when you bring your complaint to God. When you just come before God in complete honesty, just acknowledging the reality of the pain that you're facing or the pain that you're seeing. It's okay, y'all, to just cry in the presence of God because we have the Holy Spirit in us who actually takes that and interprets that in ways that we can't even articulate. There's a, a groaning, a deep pain that God invites us to just express in his presence. And sometimes we just need to sit in his presence and weep. And God knows what those tears mean. He just starts praying by crying and grieving and bringing his broken, anxious heart to God. And then eventually he's able to start formulating and articulating these words to God. Verse five. And he said, "O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments and statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. God, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. Oh, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was a cupbearer to the king. Listen, this is an incredible prayer. And what I want you to see here at the beginning of Nehemiah's story, which is really actually the beginning of God's story of bringing renewal amongst his people. What you see here is that God actually invites us through our prayers to shape history. And I know that sounds like a crazy statement and I'm not using it as hyperbole. I'm saying that our prayers somehow in God's sovereignty, God uses our prayers and works through our prayers to shape history. And so you say, well, what what does that prayer look like? Well, we see it right here. Number one is worshipful prayer. You want to pray the kind of prayer that shapes history? Well, listen, it starts with an acknowledgement of who God is. It's worshipful prayer. Look at what Nehemiah said, verse 5. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven. Listen, Lord there in Hebrew is Yahweh. It's the, it's, the, it's the personal covenant name that God shares with his people. But God isn't just personal God is also powerful, and that's why Nehemiah says, O Lord, God of heaven, God of heaven. In other words, God, you don't just rule over your people, you rule over everything. You rule over everything, and you see this in the history leading up to the book of Nehemiah. Now, I summarized that for you at at a kind of 60,000-foot level, but I want you to see that summarized here in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 
So 2 Chronicles chapter 36 leads us right into Ezra and Nehemiah. And I want you to see this kind of summary of the story. Uh, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 15. It says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers, the prophets of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. In other words, they had reached the point of no return. They had gotten to that point where God says enough is enough. I've been patient with you. I've warned you over and over and over again. And you've stiffened your neck and you've hardened your heart and you've persisted in unrepentant sin. And so God says, all right, then have your way. Verse 17, therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans. That's another way of referring to, of referring to the Babylonians. <clears throat> he says, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon and they burned the house of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword and they became servants to him, the king and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Now, pause, rewind for a second, because when you read that phrase to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, it's like a hyperlink that takes you back in history to these prophecies that God was sending his people all along. And so you rewind to uh, Jeremiah 25, and Jeremiah had warned the people that they would be taken into exile for how long? For 70 years. But then God also gave a promise to his people, and you see this in Jeremiah 29. Now, I don't have time to go into all of this, but I do want to read this passage because it's one that we tend to often quote and apply out of context. Jeremiah 29, verse 10, but for thus says the Lord, listen, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place in Jerusalem. Verse 11, here's why. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. God says, yes. I am going to bring my judgment and my discipline against you for a season in order to draw you back to me. But then I am also going to unleash my grace. And after that 70 year period, I'm going to restore you to the land. And so you fast forward now to 2 Corinthians chapter 36, verse 22, where we left off. And it says now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia. Here's the proclamation. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him let him go up. And that's exactly how the book of Ezra begins, word for word. Now, I give you all of that background. I wanted you to see that for yourself in Scripture, because when we look at the prayer we're studying in Nehemiah chapter one, what I want you to see is that when Nehemiah prays, O Lord God of heaven, he's acknowledging the fact, listen, that God has been in control the entire time. 
and that God is still the one who is ultimately in control. Listen, God is actively ruling over and presiding over everything, everything in heaven, everything in the universe, everything on earth, everything in your life. God is the one who is in control. Listen, which means he has the power to use anything and everything, even the bad things for his good purposes. Now, listen, listen, God isn't the source of suffering, but he is sovereign over it. He's not the cause of all the evil in the world, but he is still in ultimate control over it, which I know raises all kinds of questions. But think about the alternative. If God isn't in control in the midst of evil and suffering, then who is? And if he isn't in control over evil and suffering, then how could we ever be confident that he's able to bring good out of it? Listen, one day Jesus will return to judge sin and completely rid our world of evil and suffering. But in the meantime, we, while we live in this fallen world, it is good to know that God has a plan. That God has a plan and he is actively ruling and reigning. That God is still at work. Listen to me. God is not up in heaven biting his nails. He's not nervous. He's not wondering how history is going to unfold. He's not looking at the 2024 presidential election like, well, it's a toss up. We'll see how this goes. He's not looking at the pending layoffs and worrying about your future. History is not a surprise to God. He is not the ultimate source of suffering or the, or the cause of evil, but he is sovereign over it and he is in control over all of it. And that gives us the confidence that he has the ability and that he will one day in ways that we can't fully understand right now, bring ultimate good from it. And that's why Nehemiah brings the situation to him, the God of heaven, the CEO of all creation, the king above all Kings and Nehemiah pauses to worship God as powerful, but he also pauses to worship God as faithful. He says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. He worships God because God is faithful. That covenant love, that stubborn love, that pursuing love that keeps coming after us, not because of our worthiness, but because of his faithfulness. And listen, Nehemiah isn't just buttering God up. God doesn't have a fragile ego that needs to be pampered and propped up by our compliments. Our worship doesn't remind God of who he is. Our worship reminds us of who God is. And Nehemiah lifts his eyes above his circumstances and he looks to the hills from where his help comes. He prays to the God of heaven, the faithful God who keeps his covenant throughout all generations. This is worshipful prayer that shapes history, but not just worshipful prayer, humble prayer, humble prayer. Because we come before God in humility in light of who God is, which we just talked about, but also in light of who we are. Continue in his prayer. Verse 6. I got to move faster. We only got through one verse. He says, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Now, remember, this is why I gave you all that history. Remember, the people of God were taken into Babylonian captivity as a consequence of their own sin. But here's the thing. Nehemiah wasn't even alive when all that happened. And yet he's confessing sin that he's never even participated in. And listen, this is especially difficult to understand for those of us in more individualistic cultures. 
But this kind of corporate confession is so important for a couple different reasons. First, in corporate confession, we acknowledge the sin of the past. Nehemiah starts by acknowledging the sinful history that has shaped his current context. He's not taking responsibility for their choices, but he's taking ownership of the consequences. In other words, he's saying, God, it wasn't my fault, but now it's my responsibility. And this theology of corporate confession is so important for us in our own context, particularly as we think about the history of sin in our country, the patterns of sin in our particular ethnic community, and the generational cycles of sin in our own families. We don't exist in a vacuum. There's history that has shaped the context that we're in. And when we confess those sins, listen, when we confess those sins, when we're, when we're honest about those things that maybe we weren't even directly a part of, we didn't participate in, but we know these are sins that affect our context or, or maybe in our own ethnic community, they are, there are patterns of sin that we're often, because of our blind spots, prone to repeat or generational cycles of sin in our families that honestly give so much explanation for the inclinations and temptations that we constantly battle against in our own lives. Listen, when we confess those sins, we're not taking the blame, we're taking a stand. And there's a difference. We're taking a stand to say, God, we acknowledge that we have a role to play in correcting the sins of the generations before us. The sins that have set the table we're currently sitting at. The sins that caused the consequences we've now inherited. We're not trying to sanitize that sin. We're not trying to rationalize that sin. We're acknowledging the reality of their sin. And we're taking a stand to say that we don't want to repeat or contribute to that sin in our generation. That's what the depth of this kind of corporate confession looks like. And so listen, in corporate confession, we acknowledge the sins of the past, but we also admit our own sin. We admit our own sin. And that's what Nehemiah does. He says, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Listen. None of us is exempt. None of us. And while we're all made in the image of God, this common thread of sin is what links us together under the judgment of God. And this kind of confession acknowledges, listen, something radically different than what our modern day American culture teaches us. Listen, this kind of biblical confession is the way that we acknowledge that something is wrong with us. Something is wrong with us. We are not okay as we are. We're not okay as we are. And listen, here's the thing. Deep down, we know that. We know that we're not okay as we are. We know that we have been shaped by our patterns and cycles of sin in the past that affect us today. We know that deep down there is something that is off, that we don't live up to our own standards, much less God's standards. We know that there is dysfunction. We know that. But we're caught up in this postmodern project to try to make ourselves feel good about ourselves by denying the reality of sin. Listen to me, though. Listen. The Bible declares what we all intuitively realize, that we are not inherently good people just trying our best to honor God. No. Our fallen sinful nature pulls us in the opposite direction. We are people who have disobeyed God and have desecrated ourselves and others in the process. And in God's mercy, he says, don't let your sin draw you away from me. Let your sin draw, drive you closer to me as you confess it and ask for my help and forgiveness. 
And listen, hear me. I've said this before. God will meet you where you are, but not where you pretend to be. To the extent that we try to ignore or rationalize or just dismiss and minimize the sins of the past or the sin of the present in our own lives. To that extent, we also hinder ourselves from experiencing the kind of grace and transformation that God wants to unleash in our lives and in the lives that he brings us into contact with. And listen, confession is the way we take off the disguise. Confession is the way that we say to the culture around us, we are not willing to play your game. Amen. We're not willing to act like just everything is okay and, and you're fine and I'm fine and there's nothing wrong with us or nothing wrong in the world. No, confession is the way we acknowledge the reality that something is broken and that brokenness starts in us. It's a humble acknowledgement that God owes us nothing, that in fact, the only thing we actually deserve from God is his judgment. And when we humble ourselves that way, then James chapter four, verse six says this, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. In other words, he's saying, take this seriously, y'all. And then verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord. And here it is. He will exalt you. When you are honest before God about the true sinful condition of your own heart and the true sinful condition of humanity that has set the context that we all live in, then it swings the door wide open for God to, to unleash his grace and his mercy and his transformation in a way that brings the kind of renewal we pray about and that we see lived out in the pages of scripture. This is prayer that shapes history. It's worshipful prayer. It's humble prayer. And that puts us in the appropriate posture that come before God, listen, with bold prayer, bold prayer. I love Nehemiah's prayer, verse eight. He says, remember the word that you commanded your service, Moses saying, and then he begins quoting directly from Deuteronomy, that if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. And he's saying, okay, God, I I've acknowledged that in, in your word, you promised consequences for sin, and we're living in that. But I love what Nehemiah does. He says, but God, that's not all you've promised in your word. Verse 9, he says, you also promised that if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven. And I love that connection that he prays to the God of heaven. And he says, and even if in the consequences of sin, we're scattered to the uttermost parts of heaven, you are still the God of that heaven. You are still at work, even in the consequences of our sin. He says, from there, I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. In verse 10, he says, God, they are, he's interceding. He says, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. I love this, y'all, because Nehemiah's prayer, this is what I want you to see, is saturated with truths and promises from God's word. Just in this one prayer, Nehemiah is drawing language from Daniel 9, Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 9, Deuteronomy 30, 1 Kings 8, and the book of Exodus. His prayer life is saturated with the truth and promises of God's word. And listen, here's why that's important for you and for me. Because bold prayer is not confidence that God will do whatever you say. Bold prayer is confidence that God will do everything he said. That's the difference. That's where our boldness in prayer comes from. Our boldness in prayer comes on the basis of what God has revealed to be true and what God promised he would fulfill. Our boldness in prayer comes from knowing everything that God has said. It doesn't come from us just manifesting our desires. Because listen, let's real talk. 
If I manifested every single one of my desires, my life would be a mess. You know the people I was pursuing back in the day before I was following Jesus? Thank you, God, for, 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 your, for blocking some of the things I wanted in my life. No, no, our boldness in prayer is not just us manifesting what we want, that the universe will now align with that. No, that's not biblical prayer. It's not even reality. That's mythology. No, our boldness in prayer comes from the confidence that God will be faithful to his word. So listen, listen, do not settle for less than God's promises in your life. Some of y'all have been just neglecting God's word because you think it's just a religious thing that we talk about to check off your daily quiet time. No, it is life. It is the basis of the confidence that you have to come before God in prayer. And the more you know and understand God's word and the more confident you are in his faithfulness to his own promises and what he has revealed, the more bold you will be as you come before God in prayer. First John five, verse 14 says, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything and here it is, according to his will, which is revealed, revealed in his word, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. I love what Hudson Taylor once said, the, the legendary missionary in China who went through a rough season and didn't have all the resources or, that people thought he needed in order to do what God had called him to do. And I love what he said in a, in a letter. He said, we have 25 cents and the promises of God. And the promises of God. And for you and for me today in 2024, Oh, we have the ultimate promises of God fulfilled that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. You see, we're reading about these old covenant promises that God made his people, but you flip over to the New Testament and you realize something, right? That God's people never fully lived up to their part of the covenant. And you and I have never lived up to everything that we've desired to do or that God commands us to do for his glory. And so every single one of us deserves to be cut off. And so we know what God did. You and I know that as you flip into the New Testament, God sends Jesus, the covenant-keeping Jewish man in Nazareth, from Nazareth, who lives a perfectly righteous life before God in our place, and then he dies. He takes the curses, right, of, of covenant breaking that you and I deserve, and he takes those curses to the cross upon himself, and he spills his blood to cover our sin and to pay the penalty that you and I deserve, and he rose from the grave to establish a new covenant that you and I get to enjoy. And what does that look like? It looks like this. It's kind of crazy. It looks like the curses of the covenant that we deserve, Jesus took those so that we can enjoy the blessings of the covenant that only he deserves. This is what God has done for us, and it's the promise that gives us our confidence as we come before him in prayer. It's why Hebrews 4, 16 says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And listen, that's why we can be bold enough to be specific. Not, not because of our worthiness, but because of God's faithfulness. I know how some of us think we struggle to pray bold, specific prayers because we know, we know, even with gospel theology, we know that God is not obligated to do exactly what we want him to do. And so we say, OK, well, that, that was great. That's great for Nehemiah. I mean, he had such a clear promise that God was going to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. That makes sense that he was bold in his prayer. I don't have such a specific promise like that about my job or about a relationship or about what I don't have that kind of specific promise. I know God's a healer, but he never promises that I 
that he'll heal in every single situation. I know God's a provider. He never promises that I won't go through financial difficulty. I know God cares about my joy, but he doesn't promise to always fulfill all of my desires in this life. So why should I assume that God will answer my prayers? Well, here's the answer. God never tells us to assume. He just tells us to ask. He just tells us to to ask, to ask with audacity, to come before his throne of grace with what? With boldness. To ask. We don't know, we don't assume that God is going to do everything exactly the way we think he's going to do it. But why would that stop you from uh, taking claim of your divine privileges as a son or daughter of God to continue to barrage the gates of heaven with the prayers that he invites you to pray? He doesn't tell us to assume, but he does tell us to ask and to keep asking. And that's what Nehemiah does. That's what he does. That's how he ends this prayer. Verse 11, he says, Oh, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And here's where he gets specific and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. He does. Listen, he doesn't just say, God, your will be done. That's a great prayer. But God invites us to lean in and to go after a little bit more, to take his promises that may be general, but then to apply them in prayer to our specific situations. And Nehemiah doesn't know whether or not God is going to use him in the way that he does. All he knows and all he's saying to God is, listen, God, I'm taking you up on your word. I think so many of us wonder, why me? I think Nehemiah said, why not me? Why not me? I'm trusting your word, God. I've sat before you and purified my heart and laid my desires before you in in prayer. God, you've put me in this strategic position. And I think, God, you've given me some resources and some gifts to be able to get involved in, in your kingdom purposes. And so, God, I'm just laying that before you. And I'm boldly asking you now specifically, would you give success to your servant as I approach my boss? As I approach The king in the sight of this man give me mercy. And remember who this man is. This is King Artaxerxes. This is the ruler of the known world. This is the man who had recently, when the people of God tried to start rebuilding the walls before Jeremiah's time, he sent the government in to forcefully stop them and to tear down all of their progress. This is the ruler of the world, and you know how that goes, where you can't just show up any kind of way talking crazy, right? because you will be done. But the reason he prays this bold prayer is because he's saying, God, I know who this man is, but God, I'm coming to you, the God of heaven. He's the ruler of the Persian empire. You are the ruler of the universe. You are the ruler over all of history. All of this has been you orchestrating your perfectly timed will. And I may not understand how all of those pieces fit together, but I am boldly coming before you to ask you to bless me as I attempt to play my role in bringing you glory. He is specific, and the rest of Nehemiah's story is essentially one long answer to prayer. And I love how one writer put this. He said this, listen, listen. He said, intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of what God has promised. Intercession visualizes an alternative future to the one apparently faded by the momentum of current forces. Prayer infuses the air of a time yet to be into the suffocating atmosphere of the present. History belongs to the intercessors who believe the future into being. Even a small number of people firmly committed to the new inevitability on which they have fixed their imaginations can decisively affect the shape the future takes. These shapers of the future are the intercessors. 
These shapers of the futures are the intercessors. Listen, in a way that we can't fully comprehend, God invites us to participate in bringing about his will through our prayers. If you know Jesus, if you are in a relationship with the God of heaven, God has invited you to do more than just go through the motions of religiosity and kind of American churchianity. He's actually swung the vault open of all of heaven's resources and he's invited you in and he said, listen, I've invited you to be a co-laborer with me. Let's make some history. Let's shape some history, not in your own strength and your own capabilities, but I have invited you to come to me, the God of heaven, and to partner with me in shaping the course of history. The course of history around you, as you look and you see brokenness in people's lives and in our communities, and as you still see gospel poverty all over the world, as you go into environments like St. Marshall with the gifts that he's given you to bring order in chaos and to bring blessing where there has been confusion and all kinds of brokenness. Listen, God invites you and me to start first on our knees in prayer because, listen, whatever God wants to do through us, the work he wants to go, the, do through us is always going to begin with the work he wants to do in us. Amen. And that work begins as we humble ourselves before him and we seek him in prayer. And this is why we prioritize prayer together as a church family. So we got another church-wide prayer night coming up Friday, March 1st, 7 p.m. right here at NBC Tyson's down in the Smith Center People from Tyson's, every location, if you're watching online, you don't even have to be a part of our church. Let's come together and shape history. Let's come seek the God of heaven on behalf of our families and our community and our country and the nations of the world. Let's come before the God of heaven and let's seek his face and let's make ourselves available to him. Let's get on our knees and surrender ourselves to him. Worshipful prayer and humble prayer and bold prayer before him. And sometimes it requires persistent prayer. And I know this hits so many of you as we close out to pray. And Lord willing, we'll talk about this more next week. But you notice Nehemiah prays day and night. And when he starts praying in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, until the time where he actually begins to implement any kind of plan in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, it's a four-month period of him just praying and seeking and processing before the Lord. And so listen, God may invite you to persevere and persist in prayer because you are confident that he will be faithful. And you come still fully surrendered to him, saying like Nehemiah says over and over again in this prayer, God, I'm your servant. I'm your servant. I'm praying boldly, but God, I, I'm still your servant. I'm praying specifically, but God, I am still your servant. I am not just here to twist your arm to do what I want you to do. I'm ultimately here making myself available as your servant for you to do whatever you want to do through me. Amen. God, I'm willing fully surrendered to him. Listen, I want you to take some time to just think about this simple question here at all of our locations if you're watching online. And maybe just use this as a, a prompt to just pray to God. Listen, what do you need to hold before God in prayer? And I love that imagery of just holding something before God in prayer. Maybe it's the brokenness that you see around you and you're wondering, God, are you calling me to step into that? Maybe it's brokenness in your own life, your own family. Maybe it's needs that you see in the church and you've listened to announcement after announcement and read ministry directory after ministry directory and got e-news after e-news. And you know you should probably be a church group leader by now. You know I had to throw something in there, right? right? And you're just praying. You're like, God, what do you want me to do? What do you need to hold before God in prayer? We hold it loosely, but we hold it boldly before him. Would you just take a moment between you and the Lord and just pray about that. And then I or one of the pastors at your location 
is going to close us in prayer and give us some instructions before we're dismissed. Take a moment between you and the Lord. Father, we come before you, Lord, holding all kinds of different things before you in prayer. We hold them loosely, Father, in humility before you, but we hold them boldly, boldly, God, because you invite us to come before you with boldness. And Father, I pray, God, that you would shape our hearts, you would mold our desires, that you would increase our faith. Help us to be fully surrendered, God, to however you want to use us to work through us or to work in us. Father, I pray even for that person who their first step might need to just be a first decision to turn from their sin, let go of control of their own lives, and to put their trust in what Jesus has done for them as Savior and King. Lord, I pray, God, that you would open their eyes and open their hearts to receive that gift of your grace in salvation today. Father, we lay our hearts before you, and we are thankful, we are thankful, Father that our lives are in your capable hands. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.